Today we are discussing colds and flus. You'll learn about some potent behavioral tools for bolstering your immune system. And of course, we will discuss how to avoid getting colds and flus. But the good news is there are indeed science-supported behavioral protocols that one could consider in order to avoid and treat colds and flus. You have a problem. And that problem is that you tend to touch your eyes very often. In fact, you tend to touch your eyes most often after you shook somebody else's hand. There have been several studies now, primarily from Noam Sobel's lab at the Weizmann Institute, showing that when people encounter another person and they shake their hand, they either touch their eyes or touch another region of their face very close to the eyes, or that they touch their hand to their mouth. We are pretty much wired to contact our own face with our own hands at the level of our eyes, nose, and upper lip and around the eyes very shortly after we touch somebody else's skin. And if you are mindful of it, you can actually avoid bringing colds or flus to your face. The point that I'm trying to make here is that in order for you to catch a cold or flu, that cold or flu virus, the little particles of cold and flu virus need to make it into your body. And the primary entry sites are eyes, nose, mouth, and the primary actions by which we bring colds and flu viruses to our eyes, nose, mouth are by touching other people or by touching other surfaces that have cold or flu virus. We are literally bringing the virus to ourselves. So a little bit more conscious awareness about that fact means that you can probably avoid colds and flus to some extent. Now is the appropriate time to start talking about how to allow your immune system to function at its best such that you can combat colds and flus. Meaning, if you are exposed to a cold or flu, that is, if it breaches that physical barrier of your skin and the mucosal lining of your nose, your mouth, or it gets into your eyes, that you stand the greatest chance of defeating that cold or flu at the level of your innate immune system. Now, fortunately, there are a lot of different things we can do to improve the function of our immune system. So what are those? Well, some of these will be pretty obvious. Things like getting enough quality sleep each night. We know, for instance, that if you're sleep deprived, especially if you stay up all night, but certainly even if you only get 50% or 75% of your sleep requirement, that your innate immune system is going to suffer. It's not going to be as effective at combating flus or colds. In addition to that, we know that exercise of specific type and specific duration and specific intensity can serve to bolster the innate immune system. And we'll talk about the specific exercise protocols that can best achieve that. We also hear, and it's absolutely true, that we need adequate nutrition. If we are in a caloric deficit, for instance, if we're trying to diet through the winter months, which many people try to do, that can place our innate immune system in a bit of a compromised state. And then of course, we hear about stress, that we're all supposed to regulate our levels of stress, not get too stressed. And here I have to put an asterisk next to those statements because yes, indeed, chronic stress, meaning stress that continues day after day after day, or even short periods of stress that impede our ability to sleep at night can indeed reduce the functioning of our innate immune system. However, it's also clear that short bouts of stress provided that they don't inhibit our ability to sleep that night, can actually enhance the function of the immune system. The inflammation response is also an important component of that innate immune system that allows us to combat infections. We want inflammation available as a tool to combat infection. We want cortisol available as a way to activate that inflammation and other aspects of our immune system. We just don't want so much cortisol and so much inflammation that we can't sleep and that our gut microbiome suffers. The gut microbiome, which are the trillions of little microbacteria that interact heavily with the immune system and help support the immune system, you wanna keep the gut microbiome healthy. And this is very important. Keep in mind that the microbiome doesn't just exist in the gut that the microbiome also exists on the surface of the eyes and in the nasal passages. And indeed, the microbiome that's specific to the nasal passages is very different from the microbiome that exists within the mouth. And the microbiome that exists within the mucosa of the nasal passages seems to be the most effective at combating any viruses that we encounter, especially cold and flu viruses. So what does that mean? This is where I get to make a strong push for being a nasal breather. Certainly in sleep, you wanna be a nasal breather. 
but also throughout the day, unless you're speaking or unless you're exercising hard enough that you need to breathe through your mouth or unless you're eating, being a nasal breather is known to provide the right milieu, the right environment to keep that nasal microbiome at its healthiest and to promote the diversity of microbiota in the nasal passages that can best protect you against colds and flus. When we breathe through our nose, we heat the air in a way that's very different from the way we heat the air when we mouth breathe. And by heating the air that's coming into the nasal passages, it shifts the probability that cold or flu viruses will successfully embed in the mucosal lining and infect the underlying cells and get into the other cells and tissues of our body. So if it sounds overly simple, just breathe through your nose. It is very simple, but it's also very effective. Now, it's also clearly the case that keeping your gut microbiome is advantageous for keeping your innate immune system at its most robust level of functioning. And I should mention that your gut microbiome isn't just about your stomach. You know, we hear the word gut and we think stomach, but it's actually the entire length of your digestive tract from your mouth out the other end. And different microbiota exist at different locations along that tract of mucosa. And there are a couple things that one can do in order to make sure that the gut microbiome is best supported along that entire length. The first one, and this was covered on the episode that we did with my colleague, Justin Sonnenberg, who is a world expert in the gut microbiome. And that is to consume anywhere from two to four servings of low sugar fermented foods per day. So things like sauerkraut, things like kimchi, things like kefir, things like kombucha, and of course, things like yogurt, which have active live cultures. Those are the sorts of things that are going to best support the diversity of microbiota along the entire length of the gut microbiome, such that your gut microbiome can do its job in supporting your nervous system, but especially in the context of today's discussion, your immune system. We know that exercise of 60 minutes in duration or less, and that is intense, but not all out effort. That if you do that sort of exercise for about 60 minutes or less, you promote the exchange of components between the blood and the lymphatic system that increase the circulation of those cells and chemicals within the innate immune system, such that not just during exercise, but for many, many hours afterwards, maybe even as much as 24 hours afterwards, your innate immune system level of baseline activity is ramped up, allowing you to better combat infections such as colds and flus. Okay, so this is an incentive for getting regular exercise of 60 minutes or less per day. However, it is absolutely not the case that more is better. In fact, it's probably the case that less is better. Here's what we know for sure. People that do bouts of walking each day for about 60 minutes, brisk walking, experience increased T cell function. So that's an immune cell that goes out and combats cold and flu viruses and natural killer cell activity. So those increase. Cytokines increase. Stress hormones such as cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine, also called adrenaline and noradrenaline. Those are deployed as well. So 60 minutes or less of this moderate to high intensity exercise creates this mild stress response and an increase in the function of the innate immune system. However, people that run a marathon, they experience a very different pattern of immune response to that long bout of exercise. People who just ran a marathon and people who have been training for a marathon and are approaching that marathon are severely immune compromised. The levels of their T cell function are way below baseline, meaning their innate immune system is not functioning nearly as well as it would if they were to not exercise at all. Their natural killer cell activity is also greatly diminished. These are huge, huge reductions in these cells that is in the function of the innate immune system and their stress hormones and their inflammatory molecules such as cytokines circulating in their blood are extremely high. And let me be very direct. I'm not discouraging people from running or training for marathons or half marathons. I think that's great. Just understand what you're doing to your immune system when you do that and take the necessary precautions. But I think most people listening to this are trying to think about ways that they can avoid getting colds and flus and certainly running marathons is not going to be the way to do that. Now, one more point about exercise, and here we're also going to dovetail in an important point about nutrition. It's very clear that if you are in a state of chronic stress because you're exercising a lot and or because you're not sleeping enough, or for whatever reason, maybe you have a lot of life stress, it's very clear that ingesting carbohydrates after exercise can help attenuate some of the inflammation that exercise induces. When we talk about carbohydrates, we're talking about 
rice, oatmeal, pasta, those sorts of things, so-called complex carbohydrates. And fruit, post-exercise, has been shown to attenuate, to reduce some of the markers of inflammation by about 30 to 40% when contrasted with water-only intake, especially if you're training fasted. But if you fast and then you're drinking caffeine and then you're exercising and that exercise goes longer than 60 minutes, Certainly if it goes longer than 75 minutes, you would do well to ingest some complex carbohydrates, maybe also some fruit, perhaps not immediately after exercise, but within the 45 minutes or so or hour or so after exercise so that you're not ramping up those inflammatory molecules and leaving them ramped up for many hours into the morning and throughout the day. Also, I don't know about you, but a nice bowl of oatmeal, some fruit and a protein drink or some eggs after an hour or so of exercise in the morning when I haven't eaten anything since the night before tastes really, really good. So continuing with the theme of things that we can do to improve the function of our innate immune system and combat colds and flus is the use of deliberate heat exposure, in particular sauna. Every time you go into the sauna, you're getting an increase in cortisol. We know that because the heat is a stressor. Again, don't think about heat as, oh, you're just kind of relaxing in the sauna, it's so nice you're getting a cortisol response, which can be a good thing if it sets in motion a number of other things, such as the increase in the activity of the innate immune system, and indeed that is what they observed. After the first and 10th sauna baths, they witnessed an increase in leukocyte count. Leukocytes are a particular type of cell of the innate immune system. And the overall takeaway from this study was that if you're feeling run down a little bit, or if you're just trying to keep colds and flus at bay, Having some regular-ish practice of getting into the sauna for three rounds of 15 minutes separated by two minute cool off, you don't necessarily have to do a cold shower or a cold plunge in between, although I don't see why you couldn't. You could also just get out of the sauna and be in the cool air and then get back in. However, and here we are back to exactly the same thing we said about exercise. If you're already feeling really run down, feeling kind of heaviness in the body, you don't feel well, you're starting to get some sniffles, don't get in a very hot sauna. But for sake of keeping colds and flus at bay, sure, do three rounds of 15 minutes in the sauna between 176 degrees, 210 degrees, whatever you can safely tolerate. Take those two minute breaks in between. Maybe do a cold shower or coolish shower. Maybe just stand outside the sauna in between. If you're feeling really strong, do a cold plunge for a minute or two minutes in between. You don't have to, but you certainly could. And then get back in and then repeat. Or just do one 20 minute session or 30 minute session all of which have been shown to promote the activity of the innate immune system. 